This is Digital Music Trends 144 on the 7th of August 2013. This week, NMPA versus full screen, optimistic streaming forecasts, Spotify's new browse feature, Google's Chromecast, and artists developing bespoke sites for their fan bases. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show bringing you the latest news and uh, the latest trends in the digital music industry. So DMT is available as both audio and video on iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, Mixcloud, uh, Soundcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and more. And you can follow the show on Twitter, the handle is at DG Music Trends. Join the newly formed LinkedIn group or get in touch with the feedback, comments or your thoughts on the stories we're about to cover on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week on the show I'm really Happy to welcome Olivier de Simon, head of music at your turn. Hi, Olivier, how's it going today? Hi, Andrea, I'm doing very good. You? Great, thank you. And also joining us, uh, unfortunately, on an iPad, so we can't see her, but it's uh, Yvette Modinou, co founder of uh, uh, Rich Theme, which is a, a new music discovery service. So, hi, Yvette, and great to have you on. How's it going? It's going good. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. And so, uh, great to have you both. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to start off with a service announcement for next week. Uh, as uh, next week, uh, the show will be out, but it will be mostly a best of episode with some of the most interesting, interesting news covered over the last uh, uh, eight months uh, and a few extracts from the one to one interviews I've uh, recorded at events as well. So, uh, so the, there's going to be a little bit of news at the beginning uh, if there's anything breaking that happens this week, uh, but otherwise, it's going to be mostly a best of. And part of why I'm doing it is because usually, Usually there is a so-called summer lull, especially in these uh, couple of weeks where a lot of people are away. But uh, judging from this uh, this week's lineup, uh, there's no lull at all, and there's lots of news to cover. So uh, that's great. And we can start off uh, by a news that was broken by Greg Sandoval from The Verge last night about the NMPA being on the warpath with a YouTube multi-channel network uh, full screen. So Fullscreen manage uh, the channels of uh, NBC Universal, Nintendo, Lexus and lots of other uh, big uh, uh, players uh, on the on the video space uh, and uh, the news uh, spurred uh, a, a number of pieces overnight because uh, it, it touched a chord within the music tech industry since uh, uh, it brought up a problem that I wasn't even aware of um, myself. So uh, the National Music Publishers Association has filed a suit against Fullscreen after ascertaining that some of the videos that are hosted by the by the cha- by the network uh, were featuring music for which songwriters were not getting paid. So uh, this is just one episode, but it appears as if uh, uh, other MCNs may face this issue as well. So uh, this could uh, kind of act as a test bed case for other suits that may come in the future. So one thing that I, I didn't know at all is that uh, from, what the, from the articles that I've read uh, on the web in the last 12 hours or so, uh, YouTube does have content deals with rights holders. And so if... Uh, uh, you know, average Joe uses uh, a Kings of Leon song on their video, then Kings of Leon will get a share of, of, of the publishing, or, or the writers of the song will get a share uh, of the advertising money that is generated uh, through uh, that video. Uh, but that doesn't work if the uh, average Joe content producer joins uh, a, a, a network, so a multi channel network. Uh, so uh, in that case, the agreements don't work anymore and the payments to the songwriters uh, apparently stop, uh, which is a really big deal because, of course, you know, as soon as, uh, uh, you know, you're, if you're a cover artist, say, you get, you know, tons of followers on YouTube and then you join one of these networks and then suddenly the songwriters of the songs you covered stop receiving money. Uh, I mean, I, I may have the facts... Uh, uh, not 100 percent right, but this is a sort of gist of the story so far. Uh, so, uh, you know, Olivia, what is your take on this? And and do you think this is a potentially a big problem for aggregators of content on YouTube? Well, um, I, I'm not like a specialist of of YouTube, and and uh, but but um, I've been quite involved in in uh, all the publishing issues while I was like working for aggregator, yeah. uh, the the orchard, and and uh, it, it's true that like. Uh, very often, like the publishing side was very, it's, it's a very complex uh, uh, business, first of all. And, and second, like the innovation is going faster than um, like collecting society to adapt to, to the services. Yeah. Um, so we have been like seeing like huge struggles to, to actually make this uh, legal. In this, in this case, I feel like it's more like a, a flag saying like, hey, uh, we now need to to uh, solve this because basically you guys are doing a lot of money and and uh, the the market is getting more and more mature um, and I'm not too worried about um, about these kind of issues because like when you see the explosion of of YouTube and how many businesses are 
build on, on top of the platform now. I feel it's just like adapting to the market and get something solid. And, and yeah. if we take back this like a few years ago, um, like in the US, the, the license for, for uh, the mechanicals basically, uh, they were like a really a gray area and, uh, and everybody uh, remembers of Red's Flow, which really built a, a service that was really basically solving that issue. And they, su they succeeded, uh, they did a big exit uh, with Google buying them. So I think it's just like now the, the market adapting um, to an issue more than like a, a, a real danger or something like this. Yeah, yeah, sure. If, if that what's your take on this? Do, do you feel like uh, uh, there is a, a real problem here? I mean, I, if, if, to me it feels like there is. Uh, and, uh, and if so... Uh, does it need to be solved by via lawsuits or is is there a better way for you well i mean it is a big issue as as olivier said as well but i mean i think we need to look at how people are using youtube particularly musicians i mean it's a promotional tool first and foremost so obviously we need to get the rights issues sorted but i think you know we need to be careful with lawsuits because what you don't want is actually which probably isn't quite the same thing but you don't want to end up um, suing fans who are just using their favorite musicians songs to sort of make videos and things like that so i think there's just a little bit of a gray area that we need to be careful of when yeah. we uh, i mean in this case it would be a, a, the suit would be against the aggregator that is is yeah. I, I guess monetizing against these videos in a much broader way so uh, yeah i don't think it's targeted at fans but but yeah. like in, in terms of uh, where you see uh, the YouTube space uh, going, and because of these uh, these channels growing so much, do you feel like there is a danger for songwriters of not getting as as much money as they, as they should be getting? There absolutely is, but then also for the songwriters, they're reaching out to to a new audience, and yeah. I think that's what I'm. You know, YouTube is a promotional tool in that sense, so there's sort of an, a fine balance there that needs to be kept. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's quite an interesting discussion, and I mean, it's only about twelve hours. Uh, uh, you know, I've been live for 12 hours. This story, so I'm, I'm sure we'll see a, a lot, of, a lot more commentary coming on, and, and see this uh, lawsuit evolve in the ne next few weeks. And uh, I'm going to keep a close eye on it just to see uh, where it ends up going. And uh, uh, staying on this subject, actually, uh, we covered uh, um, the new startup uh, by Jeff Rice called Audium on the show uh, a few weeks ago, and he was actually a guest on the show uh, when, when they announced it. Uh, and uh, now they've announced uh, raising half a million dollars uh, in, in a round of funding and having collected upwards of $50,000 for artists since the launch just a few weeks ago. So investors include the TuneSat CEO and CEO, plus uh, uh, Tom Coin from PTC Advisors and Jonathan Siegel. And Audium looks to recover money that is left on the table by independent artists on YouTube by identifying and monetizing videos using the music. So the company claims 25% commission on the money it recovers, but it also offers to minister and collect to add money uh, from the artist's own videos, passing 100% of the revenues to them. And so talking to Jeff, it's clear that this is not just a business idea, but it's kind of a personal mission for him to, to help independent musicians and put them on an even plane with the bigger uh, guns of, of you know major labels and large independents. So, uh, uh, Yvette, do, do you feel like uh, uh, independent yeah. musicians are in need of uh, this kind of help? Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see how uh, sort of this company is placing itself almost as a, the tune core of, of YouTube in the way that it's uh, trying to help musicians get to a source of revenue uh, that they wouldn't be able otherwise to touch. Do, do you feel like that's a fair comparison? Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think it's something that definitely needs to be solved, especially going forward. And, you know, YouTube's only getting it bigger and more people are using it to stream music and the like. But again, going back to my point before about the promotional tool, I think especially with independent artists, there's such a, you know, YouTube's so powerful for them. Look at all the yeah. artists that have become, um, you know, famous through sharing their music. And I think we need to continue with that. I think there's a real paradigm shift here where people, you know, can we really charge them? Can we really charge users to listen to one song? Or do we need to switch to maybe like a freemium model where the basic experience is free, but actually you're paying for other things. So yeah, um, yeah like yeah. gigs and merchandise and things like that. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, channel, but uh, Olivia, on, on your front, uh, you know, you worked on the independent sector quite a lot, and of course, the Orchard aggregating music from a lot of different sources, from bigger labels to to small independent artists. Uh, do you feel like you know that's a fair comparison to say that uh, sort of Audium is placing itself as 
Tune Core was placing itself 10 years ago, but on the on the YouTube field where it's actually allowing, whilst Tune Core was allowing people to access iTunes, in this case, Audium is allowing people to access a revenue stream on YouTube that they can't access at the moment. Well, ab absolutely. I think it's it's great to first of all, it's great to see uh, Jeff back uh, back on the playground. Yeah. Um, because obviously, uh, he he wasn't expecting uh, the 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 year he got. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's it's great to see him back. And um, and then like talking about uh, YouTube and. Uh, there is one thing maybe I, I don't see YouTube as a promotional channel. Uh, I think it's it actually became like one of the biggest revenue for a lot of artists uh, being like from majors or or independent sector. And, and if you look at uh, Ingrooves, Believe, The Orchard, etc., they have been like very aggressively uh, taking like care of of the videos as well, yeah. and and it's it's really a revolution because uh, for years a video was really like promotional and there were like no revenue expected ex yeah. except for the either. publishing. But right now, if you look at YouTube, it's we could argue that it's actually the the most successful music service uh, in the world, and it's video. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um so that's that's really interesting and and uh and then about odium i i see this actually as a like the missing department of of tunecore maybe yeah. um and and then the question is like is is a company only doing this uh enough or or not uh and and my feeling is like this the the distribution if we talk about distribution uh, is uh, the, the full ecosystem is getting more and more c complex and yeah. actually what you do on YouTube impacts on SoundCloud, on Spotify, on Facebook, etc. And my, my question is like, can we, is it possible for Jeff and, and his team to rebuild an ecosystem starting from, from YouTube? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's like something I can answer, but, uh, uh, my my feeling is like the ecosystem is is more complex than just like one channel. Yeah, yeah, it is absolutely. Uh, I I think like it, it's weird looking at this how it's in a way similar the situation in the video streaming space is to the situation in the MP3 sales space uh, a few years ago where iTunes was really ninety plus percent of the market and there were a few other players but they weren't really particularly uh, you know. You know, they were relatively small and, and in the same way YouTube seems to have grabbed 90 plus percent of the video market I mean I don't know the figures but it feels that way anyway and in a similar way that becomes the predominant form of distribution for video so absolutely we'll see how that we'll see how that works out and uh, moving on to uh, talking about discovery uh, this week uh, Spotify rolled out an important new tab uh, for its iOS and Android mobile experience although I haven't uh, managed to get hold of it on my phone quite yet uh, but I, I assume it's one of those gradual rollouts and it's simply called browse and the feature places a spotlight on human curation so that's uh, thanks in part to the acquisition of the startup Tunigo a few months ago so the browse tab will include uh, uh, artist uh, uh, activity related playlists uh, for working out or relaxing but also mood related playlists uh, uh, so you can pick uh, if you're angry or relaxed or uh, happy you can pick uh, the right playlist for you so uh, uh, this places a focus on human curation that uh, wasn't as present beforehand uh, of course uh, you, you could uh, access a lot of playlists uh, but that wasn't the there wasn't a core functionality within Spotify that allowed you to to find the right ones for you at uh, any particular time and uh, it, it kind of looks as if they are reacting to uh, or responding to the upcoming launch of Daisy that is uh, really has been a uh, uh, you know, doubling down on, on advocating its uh, human curation side and really talking about how important it is for them to uh, present uh, music curated by humans. Uh, Olivia, do you feel like that's uh, that's the reason why they roll this out? And uh, uh, w what do you make of it? Do you, f do you feel like it it is going to help users and, and potentially drive them away from switching to another service or from using an uh, internet radio service like Songza, for example? Um. So answering to Daisy, I think it's too early. Yeah. Uh, we are expecting something, but yet uh, I didn't touch it, and I think a very, no one touched it. No, so, no one's seen um, it. But, but like on, um, 
on uh, like maybe on the strategy of Spotify and what's going on for the, for the company if if we step back a little bit like for for years now they have been like super aggressive as as like acquiring um, users yeah. um, and and one of the things that made it make them so successful is definitely the integration with Facebook the timeline that really like um, help them to to massively grow the the community, but then when you have this this huge base of users, I think the challenge is is actually retention. How can I get the users to go back on my app uh, every day, and uh, what can I solve uh, for them um, in terms of experience and and I'm actually starting to get very excited about the thing that from doing my playlist and searching for the the artist, etc., services will be more and more uh, pulling you information, which is uh, yeah. which is like really they they have so much data that now they are able to to give you like a great experience, and that's the discover. Yeah. But in the other hand, that's one side, and I think it, they did actually quite a great work. It's still, like really the beginning, but still. Um, I think curation matters, um, and yeah. Deezer has been actually building their success, especially in France, with the fact that they had there is a there is a touch, a, a Deezer touch, and it was actually the only service I've ever seen refusing to to highlight some some re big releases actually at the time because they were saying saying this is not our audience. Yeah. So having like curated playlist. Um, I don't know if it's going to be from well-known people or not, but it's it's definitely something that um, I would I would buy. I mean, I, I would consume because it's it's not that easy, and and we are like the worst to talk about this because we're passionate about music yeah. and we know quite a bit. I hope so, but uh, but uh, actually, like most of the users, they just they like music, but they don't necessarily they actually consuming. Yeah. It was true. MTV, radio, and we are getting there. And, and if you can get like, uh, uh, this morning I went for a run, if I could get like a playlist for my run ready to go, I, I yeah. would definitely use it. So I think it's, it's really about this retention and getting the, the users active. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Iveta, uh, you know, this is your home, home turf on, on the Discovery yeah. front. So uh, how do you feel this, uh, this uh, tab mm -hmm. would potentially play out for Spotify? And it's interesting to see also how it it marks a, a kind of a, a separation between what is a human led curation and what is the more automated side which is uh, in the explore tab where they can show you like you know the gigs that are nearby you or artists that may be similar to the ones that you are following or that you like whilst this is more personal and it's in two separate tabs do you feel like that's a strategy that could work for them yeah, I mean, it's a really, really exciting new area for Spotify. And I think, yeah. you know, it's that area that's really difficult to do well, because with the machine um, algorithms, you can, you know, really harness all that data. But with the curation, you're always going to have issues with scale and taste, because I think um, curation is great. And, you know, I listen to the radio, but I trust the voices on the radio that... Um, you know, the DJs, and there's some authority and credibility there. And I think that's what they'll need to build in to this curation um, and making sure that, you know, the voice that, that they're using is one that people trust. And yeah. that might be building collaborations with other um, magazines or editorial in some way. Um, it is a great step, and I'm really excited to use it once it comes through on my update. Yeah, sure. And uh, sort of looking at what you guys are doing, a, a rich theme, so... Uh, how do you see uh, your uh, recommendation side evolving as well? Yeah, I mean, our one's based, it, again, it's trying to um, cover this grey area between human curation and and machines. And our yeah. one is basically going back to musicians and looking at their musical connections. So that's how, in terms of if the artist has worked with someone, then obviously um, you'd think there was some reason behind that, and it's the yeah. artist sort of choosing um, who they want to work with, and that's how you know that's how I discover music when I read um, sleeve notes and and read NME and and, and yeah. whatever. Absolutely. So yeah, that's an interesting sort of take on on uh, that. Uh, I don't think has been done quite yet in a mainstream no. way uh, to look at the correlations between music as well. Yeah.
that's, that's exactly. awesome. That's great. Yeah. And so, uh, so looking at... Uh, uh, the, the, the last thing I wanted to cover on Spotify was the fact that they're also launching a messaging service uh, that apparently would allow people to have a, co a conversation, a real-time conversation on the service uh, based on sharing music, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, that's going to be on the browser-based uh, you know, uh, service only for now, whilst the new tab, browse tab, is going to be on the mobile uh, device only for now. Uh, we know the apps are only available on the desktop client for now. So uh, my, my, my last question on Spotify was asking uh, how important it is to try and, uh, especially as the service is uh, obviously aiming for a mainstream audience, to try and uh, bring all this together to offer a more consistent uh, experience across device. Because now, of course, if you're using the desktop client and you move to mobile, you don't have access to apps. Uh, if you're used to the browse uh interface on mobile once once it gets settled uh, you won't be able to find it on the client quite yet and, and do you think that's a problem olivia um I, I would be curious to see how how what is like the percentage of usage on on mobile because yeah. in in one year um it, it's quite amazing to see the shift on uh, uh even like personally i'm not using i'm not actually using from my computer Spotify anymore yeah. um, and and I think I, I really agree on one thing is like there is one thing that I'm uh, I'm a bit like scared of or it's like there is so many different ecosystems um, and most like a lot of them are closed uh, I'll take one example is Sonos for instance yeah. Um, how are they going to be able to get you with the same experience that you get on, on the Spotify? Yeah. Um, and that's like, that's something that is really, um, I think it's really an issue. And you see now also like uh, TV getting part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be like, how can we get the best experience? Whatever is the device you use, how can you get a great experience? And And I think it's still... It's it's still like uh, quite complicated at, at this stage, and we can see that it's even complicated when it's your own company, Spotify, uh, as a, as a company, mobile or desktop is it's already an issue. So yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's like the more you're going to be open, uh, the better it, it will be for for its consumers. Yeah, yeah. and Yvette, I was talking to the guys at uh, a company called Pulse Locker that relaunched uh, sort of their 2.0 service uh, this week, and they are a streaming service that is based on, uh, uh, that essentially is aimed at uh, mostly DJs and uh, dance music enthusiasts and, and uh, all that side. So it's quite a, uh, aims for this niche worldwide audience. And uh, uh, they decided to abandon their native app and go for a web-based uh, uh, interface because it was easier to maintain, they didn't have to deal with updates, uh, they could go cross-platform and uh, across uh, Windows and Mac without having to uh, create a whole new native application. So uh, do you think companies are still struggling to figure out exactly where they need to be and where they can make the best impact? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it all depends on your audience I mean, if you're looking at DJs maybe mobile apps aren't the way to go because you know a lot of mixing does take place you know at desktops but I think if you're looking at the general market you know mobile consumption is only going to go up so yeah. I think they say at the end of next year there's going to be more mobile phones than people or something ridiculous like that so it'd be silly to to sort of neglect that area which is so growing and important. Yeah, sure. And uh, I am uh, uh, inclined to move on to talking quickly about TVs, just because uh, Olivia mentioned it, and I think it's a it's a good segue. I had these stories actually on uh, on the lineup for last week, but we didn't have time to cover them. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, there was the, of course the, the launch of the Google uh, Chromecast. So uh, Google launched uh, this uh, thirty-five dollar device, uh, and I'm sure uh, most listeners will have already heard about it, uh, which. Uh, is essentially just a little dongle that you're attached at the, at the back of any HDMI enabled uh, TV or screen and allows you to connect uh, uh, to a variety of services uh, and also to connect your Chrome browser on your um, laptop or tablet uh, to uh, this dongle so that you can stream anything into that. Uh, so that's that's really cool and uh, uh, 
you know, from what from the reviews that I've seen, uh, a number of services already work on it, like Pandora, for example. And uh, the other interesting development in this is that uh, the UK entertainment giant B Sky B launched uh, its own box in the UK here for non-subscribers, uh, which costs only nine pounds ninety-nine, and this is a little Apple TV-like uh, streaming device, which uh, uh, comes with a variety of services already built in and it includes the option of subscribing to uh, uh, Spotify as well which uh, is uh, you know we'll have the Spotify app right from the outset making it a very compelling entry into the streaming market for more mainstream folks that may just see uh, this little box for 10 pounds and say I'm gonna pick it up and, and, and do something with it so uh, I mean f from my side I'm seeing uh, a rise in consumption from Apple TVs uh, but that's still related to the video side and uh, and so if well, how do you feel about uh, you know the tv actually taking over your music consumption as well and, and do you feel like that's an area that will uh, we'll see develop uh, uh, in the next few months too yeah i mean it's great to see uh, b sky b doing um this this new stuff but i think for me you know, i list, i can listen to music on my tv now yeah. but i don't you know and i think there's a big issue there because we haven't really moved on apart from, you know, it's still point and click when you look at television as a technology. And yeah. I think we need to move on from that and make it, you know, a compelling user experience before the mass market comes to listen to music on their television. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Olivia, do you want a, a Chromecast? Um, I have no TV. <laughs> oh, well, you can use it on a H, like on a on a, a monitor for like but, but if it's a HDMI enabled as well. It's it's very interesting because I have no TV because the TV uh, I actually don't feel I need one. Yeah. And I think what is interesting is like TV is not a TV anymore, and uh, and it's getting toward like a, a bigger screen, I'd say. Um, and what is really interesting is that typically the TV was a closed ecosystem yeah. um, and you would get your screen and then your box and basically it was really hard to get something from outside of that ecosystem getting into into your screen um, now with apple uh, tv chromecast and 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 different or other um, uh, devices basically um, it's becoming like the screen is becoming part of the ecosystem and it's what is interesting is that the service is matters more than than your TV. Yeah. So uh, basically, it's starting to be open, and you might you use the same uh, services but with a different experience. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a big shift, and that drives me to soon getting a a, no, a new TV <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that basically the experience that uh. uh I was not happy with, which was like broadcast and 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 uh, not necessarily what I wanted, w is becoming like a lot more appealing. Yeah. So it can be like watching something on TV, but also um, um, for a lot of people, TV is still the center of of your house. Yeah. Um, so seeing Sonos, uh, also they they launched recently their TV uh, loudspeakers. Uh, there is a lot of uh, activity around around the TV, and I think the experience is getting better and better. Yeah, and I, I'm super excited about the Chromecast just because it has this little feature that I, I, I'm sure it's not actually that hard to implement uh, if you work in sort of video uh, sort of s s scenarios, but it automatically switches on your TV if you send something to it, and it switches your TV to the right HDMI uh, input to be able to view the image and hear the sound, which I think is, is huge because like the, the pain in the neck that it is to try and do an, uh, you know, an, a stream to the Apple TV from my Mac. That consists of me getting up and finding, trying to find my TV remote, switching it to the right HDMI input from a DVD player, and then, uh, and then being able to do, all, to do everything. It's, it's, I think it's a huge improvement, and I'm surprised Apple haven't managed to crack that nut quite yet, but I'm sure they'll come to it. No no more cables. <laughs> no more cables. Yeah, it's amazing. No. If they just... could get rid of the dishes outside the houses, that would be great as well. Yes. <laughs> Although that, that probably won't happen anytime soon no. in the UK, given, <laughs> given Sky's uh, stronghold 
<laughs> if it was a, 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 a virgin cable world, that, that would happen. But yeah, <laughs> I think Sky, at least in the UK, is way too ingrained in the <laughs> in the market at this point. Uh, but cool, it was, it was good to talk about TVs because I think it's a, quite an interesting uh, story. Um, I wanted to move on to talk about uh, the importance of artist-gated fan communities because we had a couple of we had a, a story from Hypot this week uh, talking about the company Stageblock. So this company is specialized in building websites uh, uh, that uh, are kind of a crossover between you know WordPress and, and Squarespace and stuff like that. But they've actually delved specifically into music uh, fan sites uh, and they've built uh, two pretty huge ones uh, that have uh, recently launched, uh, which is uh, Tennessee Kids for uh, fans of Justin Timberlake and Rebel Soldier Community for fans of Kid Rock. So in a sense, this is kind of similar to the Backplane's Little Monsters site for Lady Gaga, and it's part of a movement that is seeing artists, uh, at least large artists, trying to gain control over the uh, data and communications of their fans, and perhaps not just for data purposes, but also for being able to reach them, to communicate with them, to interact with them in, in a more straightforward way. So, uh, Olivia, this is very much your domain, considering you know what you're doing at your turn and how you're seeing fans interact with each others. Uh, and so, do you feel like this is a is an interesting trend, and we're going to see that continue? And do you think that's applicable to also smaller artists, or does it only work with a uh, a uh, huge uh, artist with millions of fans as as a base. Um, yeah, I think I think like it's it's really great, and and there's like quite a lot of companies or, or artists that have uh, now their their own community. Lady Gaga uh, got uh, the, the LittleMonster dot com. Uh, then you have This Is Fifty um, yeah, and uh, for Fifty Cent, and um, I think it's really interesting that. It's really important, actually, that artists take care of their their fans. Uh, uh, if you think about the relationship in between the fans and the artists, massively changed in the in the last decade, from like Michael Jackson, Untouchable, to Lady Gaga now, where you pretty much feel you c you can touch her. Uh, the relation is really now in the eyes, and it's really important that yeah. that you get the, this channel. Um, then having your own fan, the, your own website, your own community, um, it's it's very interesting for super fans, and it drastically helps you with direct to fan sales um, and getting this this reach that is uh, you know instant. Yeah. Um, then if I put myself as a as a fan, you, there is like a few uh, challenges you you're gonna face as an artist. The first, the first, and to me, the most important is like fans. They like to uh, be there with their friends, and they like to talk about many topics, not only just one artist. Um, and they also, they are like asking for the, you know, for fun. And uh, fun is actually innovation. Yeah. Uh, so Snapchat right now is is uh, is trending. Your turn. We're like seeing a massive like uh, growth with like teens. And um, basically what they want, they want to have fun and they want like to have a strong, like something very unique or different to play with. So, so the challenge for, for a website like this is like, how can you follow the innovation and can you get enough budget basically to, to get there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So can, you, can you essentially make all these services easily accessible from your own website in a way that is... If it's a website, and then like if you look at uh, right now the the way fans are connecting with the artist, uh, it's a seventy five percent through mobile. Yeah. So, can you like are you waking up this morning and and uh, okay, I'm gonna go on on Lady Gaga, or are you going on Instagram where everyone is talking about everything? All your friends are there. Yeah. That's that's the challenge. But but I think for super fans. It's it's key and it's important to get this, um, and it can be like a website with uh, with this community, or it can be something like more like Top Spin, where you get those emails and at, you don't necessarily offer an experience, but at least you have this reach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Yvette, what what's your take? I mean, one one point that I would make is that it, the biggest challenge for the sites is uh, as much as the community sort of self. Uh, you know, it generates its own content and they, you know, its own conversations. Uh, uh, artists always go through phases, 
So unless you are Rihanna and you're releasing one album every year, and so your your cycle is essentially constant, if you have like a four year or four and a half year break like Lady Gaga did between her first and second album, and then you go off on tour, there's not a lot of news about you for a few months, or uh, there's an injury and you don't you can't communicate a lot for a few months. So h- how do you keep fans sticking to the community, and, and and is that like an inherent danger in in building them? Is the fact that you know the traffic might go up and down according to uh, the cycles of release that you're into as well. What, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a danger, but I think, you know, look at Lady Gaga's fans. They didn't yeah. stop talking about her in the four years that she wasn't, um, you know, that she didn't put out a record. So I think as long as you build in that grassroot community from the very beginning, you can't alienate those people. You know, you need to, you need them because they're going to be the ones that are going to be, um, you know, putting content on the site and potentially driving the conversations when the artist isn't you know as active as when they're touring or putting out a record yeah so yeah no it's uh, i think it, it could be a i mean I, what, I, what going back to what i started, started saying at the beginning is it'd be interesting to see a, a smaller artist and see how they deal with this because uh, uh, even somebody like uh, amanda palmer who is so uh, good at social media i don't think she's got a community at least not as far as i know that she keeps in a particular place. You know, she's active on Twitter, she's active on blogs, yeah. she does a lot of different stuff. And Twitter maybe is her main platform, I guess, uh, but she doesn't have her own channel uh, exclusively for her fans. So if she hasn't done something like that, then I'm wondering what the, uh, you know, what the uptake might, might be for uh, independent artists that may have the, an audience of maybe mm-hmm. tens of thousands instead of hundreds of thousands. Uh, uh, it could make for a relatively quiet, forum group on a website. <laughs> but like Olivier was saying, you know, it's really important that you want the official news from your favorite artist, which was, yeah. you know, um, and that's important. But also there is a social element to fan sites because, you know, they want to interact with people that are, have similar interests to them. And and I think that's important as well. So, yeah, I, yeah that's... Yeah, absolutely. But, but personally, as like a, a new artist, I think... Your strategy is like you don't want to have super fans hidden in, in the world garden because they're going to talk in between and you have no reach. So yeah. my strategy would be more like being like Crisp. You need to be on every party, uh, on all the parties. So you need you don't need to go on every social platform, but you need to select a few ones where you're going to really try to get this reach and, and basically get exposure because... Um, and and that's super like having your own uh, community. I think it's really reserved for a handful of artists. You need to reach like a certain level because, as you said, you need to get some some content. You need to get some activity to get the experience like uh, in- interesting. So yeah. I, I think it's really a very few artists that can do that. And and then it's really about using the fun where the fun is happening. You need to get to be present there. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about fan engagement, I would love for uh, uh, DMT listeners to uh, uh, email or tweet or talk about uh, you know their thoughts on the stories that we commented. As I mentioned at the beginning, the handle is at digimusictrans, or you can email contact at digitalmusictrans.com. And if you email with your thoughts on anything uh, that we covered this week, uh, I may well read your email in the next episode or anything like that. So uh, please do write on. Uh, and I know, I know it's always hard on podcasts because uh, you, you have an average idea, idea of who your f- listeners are, but uh, you always discover new people that are listening that I never got in touch with you. And they're like, oh, I've been listening to your show for four years now. It's like, oh, well, you could have emailed or something like that. But, uh, so that's that's definitely a call out that I make to the listeners to to get in touch and, and let me know what, you, what you're doing. And, and if you're enjoying the show, if you're would like to see any changes to it um, and finally i want to talk about a fantastically uh, uh, abstract story uh, and i think we can just go wild on this one uh, which is uh, uh, the abi research uh, uh, on the predictions of the development of streaming up until uh, 2018 so uh, this week there were some very interesting forecasts from abi on uh, the development of uh, streaming and uh, streaming revenues and uh, if you ask me like all these forecasts that we're seeing over the the past few months on the potential uptake of streaming are, are they don't seem to make 
any better sense than Yahoo's uh, uh, weather forecast for London for the, for, for the most times so, <laughs> on the iPhone. So, uh, you know, what, what happened is that uh, ABI Research, which is an analyst firm, is predicting that uh, paying streaming services subscribers will grow to 191 million worldwide by 2018, and the total revenues generated by that business model will top 46 billion cumulatively uh, by the end of that year uh, since the beginning of, of the streaming model. So uh, the interesting part of it is that uh, doing the maths, uh, since the cumulative revenues for streaming forecasts by ABI until the end of this year are going to be 5 billion, uh, you know, that would mean, mean a 21 billion uh, revenue, uh, 21 billion, sorry, I'm making the wrong maths. Uh, 46, 40, 40, no, 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 sorry, uh, 41 billion uh, in revenues generated between 2014 and the end of 2018. And this is a really high number. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it would essentially mean that uh, there would have to be, given that the industry uh, last year made 16.5 billion in revenue uh, recorded industry globally and uh, digital was only 5.6 billion of that it would mean that streaming would have to grow so much that it would actually overtake the cumulative uh, uh, revenues of the whole of digital uh, uh, last year and it would actually have to become more than that it would have to become uh, around 40 percent of the total recorded music revenues uh, for the world by 2018 so you know, it's a pretty optimistic forecast, and I'm sure <laughs> the guys at Spotify, Deezer, Ardio, and the like, uh, and G Google Play, and would be pretty uh, happy about it. Uh, but you know, just making uh, here, you know, we're just making wild speculations uh, about your your feelings uh, on the market and how how it will go. Do you feel like this is like thinking we're going to be f driving flying cars, or uh, or more? perhaps um, more realistically, driver less cars in five years? Uh, or do you think it's more attainable? Uh, event, I think, what, what yeah, I mean, I think the car analogy is actually a really good one because if you went back to the 1920s and asked yeah. for how many cars they think they're going to sell, yeah. you know, I don't think they'd imagine that, you know, it's, it's massive. And I think the scope for streaming is huge. And, you know, maybe the numbers are, you know, I don't the numbers are numbers but the trend is upwards and I think once we work out the delivery mechanism like I said before mobile is growing once we can make that work once we can get into kitchens and cars which is where people still use you know they buy cds to listen in cars still once yeah. we can fix that problem I think you know it's it's not unrealistic to say it could be over 191 million you know yeah yeah uh, and Olivia what are your thoughts on this I mean I guess in the music industry, we always have to be wary because it seems to evolve also from a consumer perspective slower than analysts predict. Like if, you, if you'd seen analyst reports from the early 2000s, uh, they would have, you would have thought that CDs by today would have been almost extinct, uh, but they're still like a huge part of the market. Uh, you know, as I said, total revenues 2012 for the recorded industry were 16.5 billion and digital was only 5.6 billion, so 34% of that. Uh, so how do you feel like that's going to evolve? And do you feel like we're going to be, be dis uh, slightly disappointed once again in terms of uh, uh, jumping the ship and thinking that everybody was gonna, is going to join the, the digital bandwagon? Well, it, it, it's always hard to, to come in on, on a forecast like this. Um, oh, yeah, sure. It's kind of just kind of wild speculations. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. But uh, we could have predict such a nice uh, summer in London. Um, so maybe it's the same for streaming. I don't yeah. know. Um, but, but for sure, um, it, for me, like the interesting thing is like uh, people start to be really positive and, and they see like a nice future for the music industry. Uh, we might stop to complain all the time and, and uh, take the wagon for, for success, with it, which is really exciting. Um, but uh, in, in terms of like, uh, is that doable? I still feel it's early stages for uh, streaming and there is some big actors that are still not uh, yet there. So uh, we always talk Google, it's still very early stages. Apple, early stages. Uh, there are like other other companies that could take like uh, I'm thinking about Amazon for instance uh, that could come up with something also really interesting and if you think about the number of um, like 
um, web consumers today that are not active on on, uh, on music because download is just not an answer to their needs or um, I, I think it's still very very early stages so yeah. I would love to see this as a as a real and and uh, if we one. don't reach that uh, that's fine but uh, I, I think there is the potential for sure for a really bigger market yeah that, 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 that would be amazing and uh, very exciting especially if we manage to work out all the kinks that we're experiencing in the last few months in regards to where the money is going and uh, how much money uh, the artists are actually getting from and what is being paid out to streaming services which i'm sure will be worked out over the next year or so and you mentioned google actually there was a story that i quickly quickly mentioned before we close uh, uh, where billboard reports that google has been looking at a potential distribution deal for its all access music su subscription service with uh, verizon uh, so verizon uh, uh, potentially feeling a little bit uh, the, the the heat of uh, at and uh, rumors uh, over a potential daisy partnership and also its acquisition of cricket which uh, by proxy uh, made them the owners of move music which is a really big uh, sort of lower price subscription service in the u.s and so uh, that's an interesting news we'll see uh, whether anything comes out of it uh, and uh, definitely interesting for uh, both Google and Verizon because Verizon has got 100 million wireless co customers and uh, Google definitely needs to make some headways with its uh, streaming service uh, uh, which is not uh, uh, you know yet made a huge impact on the industry yet uh, and another couple of news I want to quickly mention before we close is uh, Deezer uh, la launched a new Windows uh, 8 uh, application in all of its uh, the territories in which it operates so of course uh, uh, commitment to Windows 8 and commitment to making the service available so as, on as many pl platforms as possible uh, there's a cool article uh, by Ed Chrisman and Alex Pham on Billboard called the Pandora Wars which you should check out I'm gonna add a link in the show notes which makes a bit of a summary as to what's uh, been happening on the Pandora front and we've been covering that a lot on the show as well in the last uh, few weeks and there's an uh, interesting uh, article on the, on the Panda Daily called The Music Industry Explained I'm also going to add the, sh uh, the link to the show notes there uh, which uh, is essentially a compendium of uh, the modern music industry and it tries to explain a little bit how things uh, work uh, and uh, I think that's all for this week actually the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, South by Southwest the registration opened uh, uh, on the 1st of August so I suggest if you uh, have already decided to go that you get your ticket and you book your accommodation because uh, from what I've heard uh, at least for interactive it's already gone so I'm talking to a few people on Airbnb to try and uh, scramble some accommodation for that uh, hoping that the press pass goes through uh, fingers crossed <laughs> and uh, and that's it uh, guys uh, thanks so much for joining me i just wanted to go uh, uh, like ask you both uh, what's uh, going on at your companies uh, so uh, uh, yvette what, what's happening at rich theme and anything that we should uh, look out for other than heading to richtheme.com yeah, well, we're working on our version two. So we put out a prototype right. and now we're just collecting feedback and it will be ready in the next few months. Awesome. But do you go to the website now. It works. <laughs> That's great. Perfect. And Olivia, uh, on your turn, or what's happening? And, uh, you know, do you want to plug the, the API, for example, or anything like that? So sure. That, like, for, for us, like, uh, there are many things happening. Like, uh, like one of the focus is definitely mobile and, and a strong focus on, on growth. Uh, we have, like... Uh, a really interesting uh, um, user base uh, with uh, with a lot of teens, um, and it's uh, so the focus is really on grow on growing that, and we're really happy with the with the the current trends. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the API is is something that we have uh, been like very focused on, which is like on on your turn, you you uh, express using expressions, and expressions are ready made templates. Um, and one of the key for us was like to give uh, to the developers uh, the ability to create those expressions on the fly uh, and to push this to the to the community. So it's still very early stages for yeah. for this, but like anyone who's uh, interested, just feel free to shoot me an email, Olivia at yourton.com, and uh, I'm happy to give some uh, info on the on the API. 
That's awesome. So go and check out uh, richseam.com and yourturn.com. And thanks so much for joining me on the show, Olivia and uh, Yvette. Uh, yeah. And thank you for watching and or listening. So DMT is available on a variety of channels. As I mentioned, subscribe to the weekly newsletter on digitalmusictrends.com for weekly updates or subscribe to the YouTube channel on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. You can also email contact at digitalmusictrends for feedback. Uh, or if you know people that would be good guests on the show, uh, please let me know as I'm shadowing the show up uh, all the way up to December because uh, there's going to be a lot of traveling involved and trying to uh, get the schedule in line until the end of the year. Uh, thanks so much for listening again. Have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.